We at the Dev Foundation are so excited to be working with you all today and to be able to share some of the educational material that we have created over the years. And every time we do this, we always get some great feedback and questions. So feel welcome to go ahead and use the chat. Ryan and I will make sure that we keep an eye on that and we will do our very best to answer questions or point you to resources on our web page. Now, let's dig in. There's some great stuff. Feel free to screenshot or take some notes or take a picture with your phone as we go along. Especially, there's some slides at the end that have some great resources that we know you will find useful. So again, my name is Dr. Thea Zunick. I serve as the Manager of Community Engagement for the Jed Foundation. I've been with our organization for a little over a year and a half, and it's just been incredible to see what we get to do every single day. I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Ryan, for him to introduce himself. Thank you, Thea. And again, to reiterate what, what Thea said, happy to be here. Um, my name is Ryan Bunce. I'm a campus advisor with the Jed Foundation. What that essentially means is I'm working with about 32 campuses right now on helping create plans for campuses around student mental and emotional health, preventing suicide, and reducing substance misuse. So I think the benefit of a training like this, um, you know, like it was mentioned earlier, my background was in student affairs. I didn't have a lot of direct mental and emotional health training, um, but as someone who worked in residence life, it is helpful to have some context on how to have conversations with students who may be in distress, how to identify when a student's in distress, and how to know when it's appropriate to refer um, and you know, when you're not necessarily the best person for the student to be talking to, so who do you refer to? So that kind of brings us to the purpose of this training today. Um, if you've been through something like QPR or mental health first aid, it's very similar, you can help trainings. It's a training that we've developed at JED um, that really focuses on how to have a conversation and identify when a student's in distress, how to have an appropriate conversation, and then how to know when maybe something's out of your depth and maybe it's more appropriate to refer to someone who's a professional in the field of mental health. One thing I always like to get across to the campuses I work with on this topic is that the purpose of this training is not to expect people to be counselors. Um, you know, some people do have training in that area, but we don't expect people just because they work in higher ed to be able to know how to be a counselor in these situations. It's really to, to help you all identify a lot of times faculty and staff, students, they're positioned to have these initial conversations and then to refer a student when they need help to, to the appropriate party. So hopefully after this, this training, you have an, an idea of how to identify a student when they're in distress, how to identify signs of distress, how to have that initial conversation and how to do a warm handoff. So we'd be kind of remiss in having this conversation without asking how you're all feeling right now. So I'm going to share a link in the chat to poll everywhere. Give me one second. So if you can go to pollev.com slash jfoundation502 and then just give us one word that describes how you're feeling right now. All right, I see calm, we'd love to see that. Burnt out, kind of the opposite, but fair. Thankful. Jittery, I've, I'm on my second cup of cold brew, so I totally feel that. Interested, tired. Another calm. And I'll give people a few more seconds to fill out this poll. This is really just to kind of get people familiar with poll everywhere. We're gonna have this in the presentation a couple times just to get some engagement from you all. Um, but we also like to know what energy people are bringing into this conversation. At ease, finally, overwhelmed, sleepy. And we just like to start with this poll. Again, I think it helps illustrate too the range of emotions we come into conversations with. Um, so if you need to take a break, I see some people are tired, someone's bored, fair. 
Um, feel free to step away, feel free to take whatever breaks you need, but hopefully you get something out of this conversation. So with that, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Keep this open because we will have other polls. You can use the same link for those. So just a little context for folks. Who is the JED Foundation? JED was started in the year 2000 by Phil and Donna Saitau after their son JED died by suicide on a college campus. And it really led them to ask the question of what can college leadership be doing to protect the emotional and mental health of their students and to build a, a community of care. Um, essentially, when I was working in student affairs, it felt like a lot of this fell on the counseling center and people working in crisis management. JED tries to look at it as a, a comprehensive approach. So how can we all be bought into this mission? So you'll see our comprehensive approach right here. We don't just look at services offered, which are important and crisis management, but how can you build life skills in students? How can you build social connectedness in students to hopefully create a safety net so it's not all just about crisis management? We're partnering with close to 400 colleges at this point um, and a, a wide amount of high schools and really helping them build strategic plans on supporting student mental and emotional health, preventing suicide, and reducing substance misuse. Um, Thea, anything to add on this slide? I think you covered it really well, Ryan. Thank you. Um, and really our mission and our vision is to equip teens and young adults to be able to navigate mental health challenges, to seek and give help, and to be emotionally prepared to enter adulthood and fulfill their potential. Um, so really a lot of the tools this training included are focused on that mission. We're also committed to diversity. So you saw it two slides ago, equitable implementation. One thing that we like to focus on is that we all come in with a lot of different identities. We all have a lot of different identities and there's not a good one size fits all model to supporting student mental and emotional health. Um, you know, JED has created a lot of resources specific to various identities, and it's still a work in progress. Um, we're currently working on our Proud and Thriving model, which focuses on LGBTQ uh, plus students and how to best support them, but it's a learning process for us. So there are a lot of uh, resources on our website. The link is here, and I'm assuming that this presentation will be shared out, um, so hopefully you'll be able to click these links, but you know we have our equity and mental health framework, which focuses on supporting students of color, we're working on Proud and, Thriving, Proud and Thriving, which is about supporting LGBTQ plus students. So I would encourage you if you have the time to take a look at the resources we're developing and making sure that you're thinking about the different identities you all bring to this conversation as we're talking. So when we throw around the word, you know, there's a lot of different terms that mean different things and you'll hear us talk about mental health often, especially during this presentation. And it's a word that I think is very prevalent in a lot of people's conversations these days, especially since we experienced um, everything last year between the racial injustice, the pandemic, working from home, trying to navigate all of these different things. And so when we talk about mental health, we're really talking about the state of well-being, where people kind of recognize how they can take care of themselves, how they can navigate each day being able to be productive members of society, being able to work and fulfill the responsibilities that they have. So the idea of health is more of a positive uplifting direction. And when we talk about mental health, there's you know, lots of theorists, if any of you are psychology majors, um, you have the father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud, he described mental health as the ability to love. And by this, it seems he was kind of referring to the ability to have and maintain relationships of all kinds, to be able to work, have a relationship with the people that you're working with. Some of you right now are working in environments that might be completely digital still. You might be in a hybrid, you might be in person. How do you maintain the relationships that you had previous till now? And then we also know that um, Eric Erickson is talking about the idea of play and play is such a healthy thing to add into your daily lives. And I'm not just talking about like grabbing a box of blocks or Legos and playing, but play could look differently for anybody. It could be 
you know, like when I go food shopping and I hear good music, I will dance down the aisle. Um, in fact, my father, when I was younger, would stop taking me to the grocery store because I was just all over the place. Um, but for me, like that's a sense of play that makes me feel good. It makes me feel mentally healthy by engaging with those things. And, you know, just as with being healthy, like with your physical health, mental health is more than just the absence of an illness. It's actually working to support your mental well-being and your state of mind. So I know that Ryan talks a lot earlier about our work with collegiate students, and that's really going to be framing our work. But to know that we serve the population of 13 to 30, so some of you may be able to take a lot of the information that we're learning and not just apply it to perhaps some students that you might work with, but even folks in you know, your workplace, because think about it, ages 13 to 30, people are getting jobs at 19, 20, 21, 22. So there's a, probably a lot of folks that you're working with right now that fall directly into the scope of work that we do. But I have to tell you, a lot of the things that affect 13 to 30 also can be relevant and useful for folks outside of those age groups as well. So we know there's a lot of statistics out there that show us that young people are struggling and it's not just having a tough day, it's being diagnosed with issues like anxiety and depression. Uh, and this is really impacting their ability to thrive as young adults. And so a lot of the framework that we use is helps students not only survive, but the whole idea of thriving in their environment. Um, these statistics can be pretty staggering, although some of you might be saying to yourself, wow, this makes sense. This is probably what I would guess. Um, knowing that anxiety and depression is some of the most common diagnoses, and that we know that there are a lot of young people who have seriously considered um, suicide in this past year, and that's research that the CDC put out last year. And so again, that's why the work we do is so crucial. That's why you learning about these topics and being able to speak about them openly helps so much. We also know that there's some other things that they've been experiencing. This is a snapshot of some complaints or symptoms that students have given feedback about as we do our assessments on campus. Um, and, and we know that the student reports around suicidal thoughts and attempts have been increasing over the past several years, increases um, in, in age groups that we haven't seen before. We also know that sometimes when people have different identities and we're calling that intersectionality, those different identities often compound what students are experiencing. And so they may feel these symptoms more intensely or more regularly. Um, it's not, it's, it is surprising to many that past studies show that college students suicide is less common than suicide in non-students by about 40%, but it's likely given the increases in suicidal thoughts and attempts that the rate of students to suicide may have increased as well. And it is sometimes hard to collect this data. So we're using what we have at our fingertips. And we also know that like mental health doesn't occur in a vacuum and as you expect, they have impact in other areas of student lives too. The National College Health Assessment asks students about things that have had a negative impact on their academic performance in the prior year. Of the seven leading items on the survey, seven are in the psychosocial realm. So we see the stats here, you know, students are reporting stress, anxiety, sleep difficulties, depression, um, other things. And we know that the cold and flu and work had a comparable impact and they're all higher than they were in 2017, the last time we collected the data. And mental health and substance problems impact campus safety as well and the environment that you're in. So this is more information that we've been able to glean from the CDC survey that came out in this year in February regarding COVID and mental health, we see that, again, that anxiety and depression is continuing to increase. And even though those numbers look small, when you think about the size population, 
that's an incredible amount of people and it's a statistically significant piece of data. We know that the increases in that population were really focused on the age group we're working with. So we've kind of doubled down our efforts. We have hired new people. We're trying to do more outreach, more campaigns and being able to kind of customize our program so that more schools can approach us. And with the work that I do, which is in our development area, we're constantly trying to seek funders so that when a school reaches out to us and say, we need your help, we never have to say no to a school because they're not able to pay for the ability to work with us as a nonprofit. And then there's also our adults. Um, and some of you probably identify in that category and outside of the 13 to 30, I know I do. Um, but when you see the psychological effects of quarantine, anxiety, anger, substance use and misuse, triggered PTSD, things that constantly make you think of a time where this was really difficult. There's little things that remind me of the first couple of weeks of quarantine and it was a really apprehensive time. Nobody knew what was going on. Um, some of us were forced into situations we weren't comfortable in. Some of us were shut in our apartments all by ourselves. And so there's a lot of things that were really unique that we all experienced as adults. Um, just this list here shows a lot of common experiences that people had. And some of you might be reading this saying, yeah, I really resonate with these issues. And to Thea's point, I'm sure it's probably not shocking to see some of these statistics in the context of the pandemic, um, but I will reshare in the chat the link. If you could just really briefly share with us, what are your initial thoughts about these statistics, about the increases in depression and anxiety? Again, I think a lot of us are familiar with this on our own college campuses that we work with, um, but we just want to give a, a space for a couple seconds for you to share your thoughts. And I'm seeing not surprised, alarming, not surprised, sadly. I, I appreciate someone sharing that. And on this poll, you can upvote uh, someone's comments. So if you agree with something, feel free to do that so we can see consensus. I feel the same way, not surprised, sadly. Um, it's unfortunate that that's what, that's what it is right now. But going through a pandemic, you know, depression, anxiety going up, it really isn't surprising. But Jed's trying to tackle how can we handle that and how can we best support students as they go through the return to campus, as they go through navigating a world we all did not expect to be living in right now. Um, so I'll give people a couple more seconds to share their thoughts, to upvote anything they agree with. I appreciate motivated to do something and I appreciate that people are upvoting that. That's great to see. And I see in the chat, someone said, I feel motivated as well. So again, really appreciate that. Hopefully this will be a rise to action for some folks. And for the sake of time, I'm going to move to the next slide. Um, so again, talking about your role as a help giver, and when we do these trainings, again, I, I want to reiterate, we don't expect folks to be counselors and to feel like if someone comes to them who's experiencing stressors, who's experiencing a mental health concern, that we expect you to be the experts on it, because that's, that's not true. And I myself am not a psychologist. I don't have a counseling degree. So um, that's not what we're, we're expecting out of anyone in this room. One thing we want to talk about in terms of reducing stigma, so just to put things in perspective, who in the room and feel free to thumbs up to say in the chat who's had a stomach ache in this room at some point in your life i see a couple raised hands thank you so in the event that you had a stomach ache what would you generally do would you let someone know? Would you 
potentially go to the doctor? Would you be ashamed about the fact that you had a stomach ache? Think about why, for sure. In the event you had a stomach ache and you didn't go to the doctor, did you consider why you chose not to? So it would take a med or let someone know, maybe both, depends on how bad it is, for sure. Not wanting to make a big deal about it. Rest, maybe take medicine, depending on the severity. Bear, do some breathing exercises. But in the context of having a stomach ache, if someone came to you and said, I have a stomach ache, your response would probably be, go to the doctor if it gets too severe, here's some resources for it. You wouldn't judge someone for saying they have a stomach ache. Mental health problems can very much be like this. They might be mild, there might be transient sy symptoms. Um, you know, you might have anxiety for going to a test, for going to the doctor, but you would hopefully go and get help and be comfortable talking to someone. And if someone came to you with a stomach ache, if you're not a doctor, you're not going to tell them how to treat it, but you would know how to refer them to someone who could help them if it got to the, the point where it's so severe, where they need medical attention. We want to think about mental and emotional health concerns in that same way. There's no reason to be ashamed of them. There's no reason to not get help. And though you're not the expert, hopefully you could have that first conversation and know how to refer someone to get help for them. So what can you do in this situation? So we want you to know how to recognize when a student a peer, someone is going through distress, how to engage with that person, how to have an appropriate conversation, know where to refer them, know your campus resources, know your community resources, how to get them help, and then how to help that person feel comfortable. So again, reaffirming that mental and emotional health concerns are something we probably all dealt with at some point, and there's no shame in that. So just some kind of first rules when someone comes to you and they're, they're in distress. So you don't need to know exactly what's wrong. You just know there's an issue. So that's being intuitive about it. You want to be courageous and sensible and let, or let them know they're being courageous and sensible for asking for help and that you and your role are being courageous and sensible for offering help. You want to trust your gut. If you think there's a problem, there's no reason not to explore that a little bit further and to try and offer resources. Um, use the resources and context that you have at your disposal. Again, not expecting you to be the person to solve their problem, but to know how to get them help when they need it. And if you're concerned, always know who on your campus you can reach out to to talk to. Um, and that's going to be obviously very campus specific, but knowing both community and campus resources. And I'll toss it to Thea now. So one thing that's helpful is, you know, Ryan just mentioned, you know, intuition, trusting your gut. And now we want to give you some tools and resources and knowing what to look for. What are those common signs of distress that people might be exhibiting that you may not realize is a sign of distress? So what we try to first do is give you a framework that's a way of organizing the observations so that it might be helpful for you. I'm a very like organized person. And so I like to understand categories and sections and color codes and all that stuff. So here we have um, three main categories. We have people who are feeling their emotions, how people are thinking and how people are acting. So mental health problems are reflected in these three areas of functioning. And they're not mutually exclusive. They don't happen in a specific order. You could see one, two, or even three of those things. And in these areas, you might have a problem in feeling like you might notice that somebody is really down one day and then the next day and then a third day. And then that's a time where you're starting to think to yourself, Hmm, I need to trust my intuition and my gut that there is something wrong and this person is showing a sign of distress. Um, you might notice that somebody all of a sudden keeps forgetting 
things that they've always remembered. You know, you might have that one friend who's immaculate ever remembering birthdays and all of a sudden in the past couple of weeks, they've forgotten a, a few. And then I think another thing to kind of look at and something that was really common during the pandemic, especially, is using coping and covering mechanisms to be able to mask their feelings with um, behaviors, you know, whether it's overeating or engaging in drug use or things to help them forget or cover what they're experiencing. Ryan, did you have any other things on that slide? No, I think you covered it pretty well. Okay, so now you have this framework, thinking, feeling, acting, and you want to be able to notice after you first notice that there's a problem, trying to check in and keep track of, are these really intense? Are you seeing these signs last longer than they probably should? Do they disrupt that person's life or maybe other people's around them? Are they putting them in jeopardy of perhaps losing their job or losing relationships with people that they care about or that care about them, you know, are these symptoms, these signs of distress, you know, getting worse? Do they keep happening? Is there, is there something that triggers that feeling, that, that sign of distress? Um, again, you know, really, you know, is that person, is there, are they in danger? You know, think about these three demo, the domains that we talked about, where it's falling in and how intense they're getting. So start to categorize and think of it in terms of intensities, frequencies, disruptiveness, is it harmful? And if your, your gut, and, and, and here's the best tool you have, you know, Ryan and I say that you don't need to be a licensed psychotherapist or psychologist or sociologist or professional to know when there's a problem, you just need to have your gut or your instinct. And we're all born with that. And sometimes our gut tells us stuff and we ignore it. But in this case, we really want to listen, especially when it comes to the mental health and well being of other people that we care about. And I will say the one thing I would add there is I think it can be a concern for people. And we'll talk about this a little bit later in the presentation as well. But being afraid that if you ask the question that might lead someone to thinking, well, maybe I do have a problem when that's usually not the case. Um, and when you talk about QPR and suicide prevention, asking someone if they're considering harming themselves isn't going to put thoughts in their head they didn't already have. So um, you're not going to do damage by just asking someone if they're all right. And the other thing is you can also name the behavior like in the next slide, um, we have a couple of signs to notice and you might name that be like, you know, hey, Ryan, I noticed um, that our relationship is starting to kind of dissipate and I've noticed that your mood has been up and down more often and, and that's concerning and I care about you and I wanted to let you know that I noticed it. what's going on. And so just being able to name those things. And if you notice when I was speaking, I was using a lot of I statements. Um, so these are great tools and techniques that you can use when you're noticing these different signs of distress. The other thing that I also think is important for us to talk about, especially since we're in a digital environment right now. Um, have any of you seen the movie Inside Out? You could just give me like a thumbs up or an emoji to respond, letting me know. It's, it's a really good movie. Um, much of the film kind of takes place in the head of an 11 year old girl named Riley and she's got five emotions running through her head joy, sadness, anger, fear, and disgust. And, and they're embodied by a character who helps Riley navigate her world. The most important takeaway, I think, without ruining it, if you haven't seen it, is that it moves viewers and young people to take a look inside their own minds. And it artfully encourages people to kind of open up dialogue about emotions and feelings and something that's really important to addressing one's own mental health. So if, if you're looking for an opportunity to talk about mental health with you know, family members, friends, people in the workplace, with students, it's a great way to kind of open the dialogue because it sets the stage for you. Now, in this digital environment, you want to 
see and take a note. Yeah, elementary school classroom teachers, it's a great way to talk about feelings and emotions. And even though we don't focus that upstream, we know how important the, the young folks are and how impressionable they are. When you're in a digital environment, um, that's another great way to pick up on cues. And we want to be dialed into the person. Look at their appearance. How, you know, they're sitting. Are they always off camera? Are they, you know, always on camera and then all of a sudden off camera? Just check in and be like, hey, you know, I'm missing your face. What's happening? You know, I've done that to Ryan before. I'm like, hey, Ryan, just missing your face. He's like, I'm just not feeling it today. And that's cool. Like, he knows that I noticed that I didn't get to see his face today and that I missed it. Um, you know, looking at hashtag captions, emojis that are overtly sad or negative, that's beyond the sarcastic joke, liking things that promote negative behavior, reposting things that seem to be a little off or inconsistent with the person's normal being, um, you know, when they stop responding to messages, you know, look to see who they're following. Sometimes you can check that out. What hashtags are they following? What accounts are they following? You can look at all of that stuff and really get some great insight and see if things have changed. So the digital environment is another great place to glean insight into how a person is doing. And I think that's a great segue into the next session, so, or the next section of the presentation. So it can be very challenging, especially in the digital world. I know we probably all made that joke where we're stressed out with work and you're like, I just, you say to someone, I just want to throw myself out the window. Do you mean it? Probably not. Um, but sometimes it can be hard to differentiate when is someone joking around and when are they actually experiencing real negative mental and emotional health stress? Um, so the goal is to identify and then engage. So looking at ways that you can engage with students, Thea's kind of already touched on this and touched on this in the last uh, section, but explaining why you're concerned. I liked Thea's framing of it as making it I statement. So I've noticed you've been missing class. I've noticed you seem sad compared to what I normally know. I've noticed you've been falling asleep a lot, showing compassion. So just saying I'm worried about you, something as simple as that can really frame it in a way that you're just asking because you care. And then listening. Again, you're not there to solve their problems. You're not there to be their counselor. You're there to just listen to their concerns and then judge for yourself what's the best resource to, to refer them to. Knowing your own limits. Again, knowing when, again, it's out of your depth and maybe this is something a professional should deal with. Not every person who's experiencing a, a stressor needs therapy. Knowing when that's appropriate. Knowing when that is the appropriate course of action. Some challenges in expressing concern if someone's not receptive. They may not believe there's a problem. They may be denying the fact that there's a problem. They may be worried that facing the problem is gonna make it worse or they're afraid to face the problem. They may be worrying about stigma, worrying that, I know one common thing I see with a lot of campuses is athletes or military connected students are afraid if they admit there's a problem, maybe they can't cut it in their program. Um, so, you know, thinking through this with the person, this might be, a reason for them to shut down. Um, and it, it can be difficult if someone does say, no, I'm good, to keep pressing that because you feel like you're being intrusive or you're bothering them. If someone is not obviously or immediately in harm's way and won't accept your help, try to keep the lines of communication open. Let them know you're there if they do want to talk or they feel they need to talk. Check in with a professional staff member. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Green Dot training, but it's a bystander intervention training and they talk about delegate, distract, or direct. You don't always have to be direct in your approach. You could delegate to someone who maybe is a little bit more trained in that area. Um, you know, it doesn't all have to be on you, but make sure that you're following up with the student. So if you feel like the conversation ends, you're still concerned that there's an issue, maybe don't keep repeating it to them, but follow up, let them know lines of communication are open and then consult with someone who might be a little bit more familiar in that area. And saw someone said, I love Green Dot. I love Green Dot as well. Stand behind that. Um, not affiliated with Jed, but a great training. So just some facts about suicide. People who attempt suicide usually do give warning signs. Obviously they might not be the most easy to identify and that's the purpose of this training, but 80% of people who die by suicide give verbal and or nonverbal warning signs at some point. 
Mentioning suicide will not lead someone to attempt suicide. I said this earlier, you're not gonna put the thought in someone's head because you're asking if they're okay. And then most suicidal people have not decided they want to die and there are things that can be done about it. Something that we talk about with a lot of our campuses, we talk about means restriction or means reduction. Um, a lot of people in this position, they're about 50-50 where part of them wants to die, part of them wants to live. So any barriers you can put in place to someone completing a suicide or dying by suicide, it's going to help them and that, that should be the goal here. So most people who talk about suicide are not being manipulative. They're not trying to get attention. They actively do want help. So again, what are ways you can get them to resources to help them in that situation? And some signs to notice, again, talking about wanting to end it all. Again, I know we're in kind of a society where fatalist humor is pretty prevalent as a millennial, definitely hear it all the time, but knowing the difference between someone joking around and when they're making comments that are serious, you know, tells or something you should be concerned about and when in doubt, just have the conversation, say, are you okay? Um, giving away personal possessions, expressing guilt, hopelessness, or desperation, withdrawal from everyday life, expressing intense anger when it doesn't feel appropriate, um, asking about or actively seeking access to deadly means or means where someone could die by suicide, changes in use of substances. So maybe someone's drinking a lot more than they have in the past, or they're using other substances that they don't commonly use. Um, and then things like goodbye posts on social media. Again, it's not attention seeking the majority of the time, it's someone actually genuinely asking for help. And then what to do if someone mentions suicidal thoughts, take it seriously, calmly get the information you need to get to them, get them connected to a mental health professional as appropriate and as soon as possible, and make sure that your campus has a plan that's well known about how to get someone help if they're having suicidal thoughts. So when you're creating environments for learning, I saw some of you are in the L&D space and some of you are in a more traditional um, campus learning environment. These again are pretty transferable to all of those environments. So you can create a supportive learning environment by working with accessibility services, making sure that you know protocols and procedures to make sure that people are receiving the correct accommodations to be able to learn. And depending again on the environment in which you're teaching or educating in, it could be self-disclosed, it could be information that you are given as a trainer um, and make sure that you are being fair to the people there. You want everybody to have an equal opportunity to learn. If somebody's feeling like they can't access the learning the same way as other people that can really get them down and make them feel unsupported. You want to make sure that there's language in any kind of handout that you're giving, whether it's a syllabus or whether it's um, a pamphlet or whatever it is that you're giving out for trainings that you're doing that has information and language about addressing mental health. Um, I have been an adjunct professor at a few different institutions and I have a very clear policy that if a student needs to take a class off due to mental health reasons, um, just as they would need for feeling sick, that all they need to do is talk to me and they don't have to disclose exactly what's happening, but just say I need a mental health day off of class and I treat that the same as if they were having a physical sickness. Um, thinking about deadlines, when things are due, um, you want to make sure that you're valuing self-care and sleep. Um, I sometimes go ahead and like, I used to say, oh, this is due at 11.59 PM, just so I can give them the maximum amount of time. But then what happens is you're creating an environment which encourages them to work until 11.59 PM. <laughs> um, you want to make sure that you're constantly giving updates and checkpoints as how people are doing um, if they are trying to accomplish certain things. Like sometimes when you're doing trainings, you can do the progress bar so people can self-monitor how much more they have to go or just letting them know, hey, everyone's doing a good job or you need to focus on this or, or improve on this. You have, here's some resources that you have that you can reference. Can you uh, create wellness? in the curriculum that you're executing, you know, is there a time to have them practice some self-care? Do you maybe start each class with a two minute 
quiet meditation and getting people into the space and letting them clear their minds so they can then learn whatever the material is that you're teaching with a clear head and a clear mind. Um, timing, timing. If you're giving exams or if people need to take accreditation, when is that? You know, make sure that you're doing it at a time where there's not other paperwork or accreditations or exams happening. Sometimes that's not avoidable, but if you can avoid it, that's very helpful. Another thing that you can do is promote social connectedness. And this is the opportunity for people that they're sitting next to and learning with to get to know each other. Make sure that they can connect in small groups. And yes, not everybody loves the icebreakers and those types of things, but they do serve a purpose and they help people to get to know each other. And worst case scenario, they all complain about doing the icebreaker all together and then they bond over that. And then you've accomplished what you wanna do accomplish anyway. Uh, make sure that people know that they have support, whether it's mentors or buddies or whatever it is, that there's somebody that they feel they can reach out to. Um, Ryan and I, we have that at the Jed Foundation when a new person is hired. Um, we have a buddy that they get um, assigned to and that person reaches out to them. And it's usually somebody not in their department. And it just helps with like interdepartmental connectedness. Lots of resources. So if you're on a campus, um, you want to share resources about academic support, counseling support, communication guidelines. If you are working at a more corporate or nonprofit, you know, does your human resources have any kind of information or support like that? Um, do you have like a program like we currently use Just Works? And on Just Works, is there any resources there? Share the Jed Foundation resources. That's another great asset that you can share with folks, regardless of who you're working with. Um, thinking about language, you know, one thing that I try to, to help people avoid is to speak in absolutes. Um, like, my life is the worst, or this is so very stressful, I can't stand it. You know, it could be that the upcoming exam is important to your grade. Um, it could be, yeah, today's a tough day, you know, things like that. Um, I used to work at a university with an architecture program. And the first thing they would do on the first day of class was to say, this first week we'll re weed out all the students who can't handle it and won't make it as architects. And my students would come to me and they were in pieces because they said, I really want this. I worked so hard to get here in the first week I'm in school. They're basically telling me I'm not going to make it and I haven't done anything yet. And so using different words and language and mindsets to help people feel that they are capable and this is possible and they're there for a reason. And I would just add here one thing and the, I'm sure you'd agree with it, working at Jed, one of the beautiful things is that talking about mental health is just so normalized and that's something I did not experience working in higher ed. It felt bizarre to say, I'm stressed, I'm anxious, I'm feeling depressed about something, but it really is important to create that environment from day one in your classroom and the environment that you're in to say, it, it's fine if you're going through something, just talk about it. Yeah, and, and model that, you know, as the person standing in the front of the room, if you can easily talk about mental health and model that positive behavior, it's going to set the environment. It's going to create a feeling of psychological safety, which means that the people looking to you to learn, they're going to feel like they can be open and honest with how they're feeling as well. And so while it's all good to put a policy in your syllabus or your learning objectives about needing a mental health break, um, if, if you yourself are not practicing that or creating an environment where people feel like they actually could use it, then it's not worth, it's not this pointless. So I'd love to hear from you now, what is one thing that you've implemented or would like to implement in your classroom or learning environment to help support mental health? Um, similar, so Ryan's going to put the poll link again for us. Go ahead and head over there and give us some feedback. You've given us some really great answers so far, so I'm excited to see what y'all come up with for this. And I would just add for this poll, if you're a student in the room, feel free to stay with a peer instead of in your classroom.
All right. So it seems like there's a lot of things that are coming up, provide wellness checkpoints, breathing and mindfulness, being vulnerable and authentic with students about our own experiences. I love that. I was just scrolling through all of the introductions to see where people were chatting in from. Um, and it seems like we have a really nice blend of different um, expertises, different positions, some higher ed, some folks in other L&D spaces, um, people from O'Donnell, which is great to see. So I think, again, all of these things are helpful regardless of where you're, you're joining us from today. So we're going to go ahead and move on just to cover a few resources for you. Again, these are great things for you to screenshot, take a photo of. Um, obviously, if you're working on a campus, you want to know what your campus resources are and promoting them. And those are things that hopefully you know already. These are maybe some new ones to you. These are our national resources that we'd like to promote. Um, probably the best slide to take a picture of. You have your crisis text line. All you need to do is text START to 741-741. If people are more likely to have a conversation, we have our Trevor Project which is our LGBTQ partner. Um, and that's really very helpful if you have a certain student with a different identity and they want specific help um, because they might be having a crisis related to that identity. And there is both a phone number and a text and then also our trans lifeline, which is an 877 number. Um, we know that the number of trans individuals who experience a mental health issue or die by suicide is staggeringly high and probably the most vulnerable population. So please share those readily with people. Feel free to put them on websites, syllabuses, training pamphlets, everything. You can't put it in enough places. JED has a ton of resources here. We have our mental health resource center. We have, which people are still using our COVID-19 resource center. We have campaigns, which are CZ Awkward, set to go for families, which helps with the transition from high school to the workplace or college. Our mental health is health campaign, which is a new campaign we're doing with MTV and a parent conversation guide. So for any of you who are joining us today who are parents who might be raising someone 13 to 30 or even younger, you can go ahead and read some of those resources there that will give you guides and tips on how to have these conversations with um, the people you're raising. We have a lot of signature programs, a few of them I just mentioned, but here's a great visual of what they look like. Um, probably one of my favorite ones is our CC Awkward campaign, which is a campaign to teach young people how to check in on each other and ask them how they're doing and to get over that really awkward moment of, okay, I know something's wrong, now what do I do? And we have a few different um, opportunities for conclusions and wrap up. I'm gonna head that back over to my pal Ryan to bring us home. Yeah, so really just in conclusion, some bullet points to leave you with, stay aware, trust your instincts, make sure you're reaching out to students who appear distressed or peers who appear distressed. Um, know your resources both on campus and your national resources, um, both for students who may need just someone to talk to versus a crisis situation, and then spread the word to other faculty, other staff, other students on how to share these resources. Um, at the end of the day, if you have one takeaway, it's that again, we don't expect anyone to be a, a therapist if they're not a therapist. It's just to identify a student in distress and then get them the appropriate help if they need it. We appreciate you taking the time to sit with us today. Um, does anyone have anything that stands out to them? Any questions? I know we're almost at time, but wanted to give some space. If anyone had big takeaways, feel free to put them in the Zoom chat if you don't you know, want to express in front of the audience via a voice chat. But again, thank you so much for being with us today. This was um, a fantastic session. Thank you, Thea and Ryan for this great session um, and thank you all for being here and being with us over the last uh, few weeks with this um, with this purposeful learning festival we appreciate all of your work and we appreciate all of the information that you shared with us i want to make sure that i let you all know that you know we'll be sharing you know you will be, you'll get, be getting the slides but we'll be sharing those resources that, that ryan and thea um uh, had on their last two uh, slides with everyone on the Slack channel shortly, me following this uh, presentation. 
But again, thank you for all of you for being here. Um, you'll be getting more information from us on the newsletters, but, um, and please let us know if you have any questions at all. Um, and we hope to see you soon at our next event. Thank you. Thank you, our pleasure. And remember to continue the dialogue and continue talking about mental health and taking care of your own mental health.